I'm not going to remember it. Do, do you remember this? Yeah, no, this, I'm trying um, to remember the book. Anyway, know. okay, forget it. It doesn't matter. Look it, look it up. It's, it's fun. Um, but, but I think that, that if you were to talk to a, a creationist of, I was going to say any sophistication, but, but I'm not sure that such a thing exists. Um, um, they, they would say something like, oh, we're quite happy with microevolution. Yeah. It's only macroevolution we worry about. And the, 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 the mutation and selection of... Of a, of a pathogenic organism in a, in a hospital, that's, a, that's all microevolution. That, unfortunately, they get a lot of um, aid and comfort from some circles in biology who add fuel to that by pretending that there really is a distinction between microevolution and macroevolution, instead of realizing that, as we've known since the modern synthesis, macroevolution is just microevolution going on for a very long time. And, and um, that's one of the problems that people have in understanding. Well, I think to add to that, I, I think, I mean, I've gotten in trouble because I've exactly written that, and not so much in terms of evolution, but I, I argued and I, and I, uh, that if you say the Earth is 6,000 years old, you shouldn't drive a car, you shouldn't get in a plane. Do you know anything? Because, because y y you're being hypocritical, because all of these things depend. The, the thing is that people don't realize the connectedness of science, so it's okay. Um, you know, you, it, they think it's just a bunch of separate stories, and that's often the way we teach it. And it's okay not to believe this part of the story, but it, you, could, you should believe that part of the story. But at the same time, the, fun, the thing is, at some basic level, what always amazes me is no matter what people say, they ultimately realize that science is the way to go when it comes to concerns. For example, you know, President Bush said we should, we should uh, teach both intelligent design and evolution because we should teach students what the debate is all about. Now, that is not an intrinsically stupid statement, surprisingly, but uh, uh, the, the, it's actually ra quite rational. What it represents is ignorance, and not ignorance in a pejorative sense, ignorance of the fact that there is no debate. But the interesting thing is, when it comes... When the avian flu became a big issue in this country, what you heard was the president say, we have to quickly determine how fast it's mutating from birds to humans. You never heard one person in his administration say, you know, it's been designed to kill us. <laughs> you know, just forget about it. So, so at some point, people understand that when really it comes to the crises, no matter what they say to pollsters, and whatever, it's amazing to me that we're so bimodal or whatever that we can just sort of say, okay, we really need the science because it's, 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 it's the only thing that's going to save us. You guys are up on stage because you're famous. You're famous for, because you have great ideas, but also because both of you are very good communicators. And I think you agree with me that most scientists are not very good communicators. Is that because science attracts people that are not very good communicators? <laughs> or is it because there's part of something in the scientific training process that makes people into that communicators? And if, regardless of the case, how can scientific education be changed to make people that are scientists. I, think, yeah, I don't now. think... Well, I, I think that's unfair. I, I don't think that scientists as a, as a group are bad communicators. I think there are good communicators and bad communicators in, in any field. I, I do think that the, that the scientific uh, establishment should recognize communication skills as a virtue. Uh, it's said, I don't know with what truth, that Carl Sagan was, designed, was denied fellowship of the National Academy of Sciences because other scientists were jealous of his success as a communicator. Uh, I hope that's not true, uh, but, but if it is, then that's, that, that would be an indication of, of, of what could possibly be, be wrong. It may be that in the scientific culture there is value, prestige, kudos given to a number of papers published in Nature and Science uh, rather than, say, um, books uh, selling well to the, 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 the general public. So there is a, a, a prestige mismatch between uh, what, what one would like to see and what, what is actually there. Um, so, so maybe that, that organizations like the National Academy of Sciences and Britain, the Royal Society, uh, and the grant-giving bodies should value communication more because science does need, the, does need public support. It's, where, uh, it's ultimately where the money comes from, after all. Uh, and uh, scientists who really do bury themselves in ivory towers are doing their, their subject and themselves a, a d disservice. But actually, if you go to conferences, scientific conferences, listen to graduate students presenting their research, many of them are brilliant at communicating. Uh, really lucid, very clear, 
um, setting things out in the, in the right order. This is the problem I'm faced with. These are the methods. These are, and, and using um, imagery, using good language. There are, there are plenty of excellent communicators among young scientists and I think they just need in, encouraging, official encouraging, in, encouragement to, to get out there and communicate. Well, actually, I want to turn that around a little bit because, um, yeah, there's the large-scale kudos one gets, as, you know, from the when you're a professional, but you've got to reach that point. And and the interesting thing is, I do think we do a, a tremendous disservice and to students because we don't um, instill the notion of communication. And in fact, we don't explain to them that that you actually a large part of succeeding as a professional scientist is, in fact, your ability to communicate. I've seen, I mean, as chair of a physics department for many years, and I've seen when we hire people, how, how people who are in some sense equally able get one of the things that distinguish, one of these things some, that determines sometimes whether we hire people are how well they communicate to us about their ideas. And, and I was on a visiting committee at um, MIT a few years ago, which was trying to do something really interesting. Right now, when we take our science, they were more worried more about engineering students, but it works the same way. We require them, you know, to take some writing course, right? And the writing course is taught by some bozo they never heard of, right? I mean, from their point of view. We never, we don't, and we should start, to impose the requirement of writing and oral communication as a part of our physics courses and our engineering courses. Why? Because these students view the professors of physics and engineering as their, as their mentors. Those are the people they care about. And if they're not doing, telling them how important to communicate it is, then if they just have to take something from column B to get a, a, you know, their degree, it doesn't matter. So what we, I really think we do have to do in our educational system is make students realize and make an important part of all of the curriculum, not just the uh, writing part, but of, of a physics class and, and a, an engineering class and a biology class, that oral and written communication are incredibly important. Because, in fact, for engineers, we've, uh, uh, this, it's really true that their abilities to succeed as an engineer are not so dependent upon their intrinsic abilities as engineers as later on when they work in companies, how well they can convince their colleagues and how well they can make presentations. And we really do a disservice, I think, to our students not to indicate that their success in their own field in some ways relies as much on communication as it does on their other abilities. I think there was, I think that one of, one of the American grant giving bodies, it may have been the National Science Foundation, uh, at, at one point introduced a rule that when, when they gave money for a research grant, as, as some proportion of that, of, of, the, of the grantee's time had to be given over to communicating their, their research um, to the general public. I forget whether, was that the NSF? Well, the you? NSF, but I actually, the, by the way, I have to say, I, I, I mean, again, I have some problems with that because um, one of the things that was required is you have people who, young people, in their very first, their very first grant application, and they're just starting, they've never taught in their lives, and they have to, they have to give their teaching philosophy, and they have, to, they have to talk about their outreach efforts, and frankly, they've never done it. And, and, and it's a good thing to do, but unfortunately, I think what one finds is that people tend to put in boilerplate, and, 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 and it's probably too late. I mean, it's a good place to do it, but I think it's too late to start there. I really okay. do. Yeah. We're now, it's unfortunate it's 4 o'clock and we're going to have to stop, but I really wanted to give a, a great round of applause for you. Thanks, thanks. Thanks a lot.